All right. In approximately 53 AD, the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 11, Every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since that is one and the same as having her head shaved. For if a woman does not cover her head, she should cut her hair off. Paul expands his argument by appealing to the created order, to the glory or disgrace of one's hair length, to the practice of all the other churches, and even to angels. It would be helpful here to have some interpretive questions in mind as we survey history. Does Paul have only one covering in view, namely just the hair? Is Paul's remark on hair length a universal and creational norm? Is his prescription of artificial coverings an application of local custom that is otherwise malleable or even reversible? Does Paul think that the propriety of one is inseparable from the other? In other words, to not practice the one means you might as well not practice the other. Does Paul's reference to prayer and prophecy refer to charismata, that is, occasional, uh, spontaneous, uh, supernatural gifts uh, akin to tongues, or to common prayer and prophecy? If the former, is this for the apostolic era only? Is it exclusive to the assembly, the church that is, or generally applicable elsewhere? Does the passage assume women are permitted to address the congregation in church? And finally, does it refer to women in general or exclusively to wives? While the passage mystifies modern readers, early church fathers seem essentially united on the practice of covering. Clement of Alexandria wrote, women and man, sorry, woman and man are to go to church decently attired for this is the wish of the word since it is becoming for her to pray veiled. Tertullian, in his On the Veiling of Virgins, writes 16 short chapters on head coverings, arguing that not just married women, but also unmarried women should cover their heads. Quote, it behooves our virgins to be veiled from the time that they have passed the turning point of their age. This observance is exacted by truth. Tertullian makes an impassioned argument for coverings being a matter of trans transcultural truth. My wife calls Tertullian spicy. <laughs> John Chrysostom, Chrysostom wrote, wrote a lengthy defense of head coverings, arguing that a cloth covering over the hair is appropriate so that, quote, not nature only, but also her own will may have part in her acknowledgement of subjection. Augustine writes, it is not becoming even in married women to uncover their hair, since the apostle commands women to keep their heads covered. Subsequent to Augustine, various church councils and synods prescribed head coverings for women and the uncovering of heads for men, especially at church gatherings. Aquinas is also notable. <clears throat> he writes, It pertains to a man's dignity not to wear a covering on his head to show that he is immediately subject to God. But the woman should wear a covering to show that besides God, she is naturally subject to another. For Aquinas and others, the issue of covering was not a mere matter of custom, but of apostolic standard, natural decency, and propriety. This kind of thing is later called a mixed article. Has anyone ever heard of that? A mixed article. Something considered to be taught both by nature and by scripture. This vein of thought is represented from the Reformation going forward, but it is not the only view. As I have surveyed church history from the Reformation onward, I see a spectrum of positions which may be simplified as three basic views. Number one, in this view, covering imitates nature. A woman covers her head because God has covered her head. Here, male-female hair length and head coverings are universally binding, related, creational norms. I say binding and interrelated because in this view, if you don't do one, you might as well not do the other, and one is done in light of the other. Here, Paul codifies a creational norm. In the second view, we have a more general position of common decency. Here, head coverings are universally binding, at least because of apostolic instruction. 
general appeal to common decency is made, but this doesn't necessarily appeal to nature or creational norms. This view is often identified, at least by myself, by the uh, appeal to the presence of angels and the importance of maintaining gendered decorum. So this is more of a straightforward promotion of you ought to wear head coverings, Paul said so, here's a, here's a reason or two he gave, but without mention of the sort of the natural theological uh, extrapolation. The third view is, in its most extreme form, that of a reversible custom. Head coverings here are a malleable or even reversible custom. Nature does not, in this view, prescribe hair length, nor does it suggest the propriety of artificial covering, that is, with a cloth. This view typically has a focus on the importance of cultural customs and paying attention to one's uh, environment and the decorum needed for that. But in this view, uh, this is not a transcultural principle. It's not a u- universally binding practice, nor is it taught by nature. That is the covering itself. Let's start with William Tyndale, a leading figure of the Protestant Reformation. He writes, Paul's traditions were the gospel of Christ and honest manners and living and such a good order as becometh the doctrine of Christ, as that a woman obey her husband, have her head covered, keep silence, and go womanly and Christianly apparel. Erasmus writes, if a woman prays or prophesies in the solemn assembly with her head uncovered, she shames her head, because it ought to be uncovered in private for the sake of her husband, not in a public assembly where Christ is served, not her husband. John Collett, Collet, I'm not sure how to say that, A friend of Erasmus and an early leader of Christian humanism writes, Paul says that women are naturally inclined to take care of their hair and that human customs ought to imitate nature. It's a really good signal of the first view that I mentioned. Human customs ought to imitate nature, the best of teachers. Women ought to show, should show, diligence to cover what nature wishes to be covered. Wolfgang Musculus Renaissance humanist and Christian reformer who had, by the way, a most excellent name and a most excellent beard, (laughs) wrote, quote, the propriety and appropriate discretion of both men and women should be maintained in the church, such that the man should prophesy with his head uncovered and the woman with her head covered or veiled. Martin Luther writes, the wife wears a symbol of authority, that is, the veil on her head, as St. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, that she is not free, but rather is under obedience to her husband. The wife veils herself with a fine, soft veil, spun and made from pretty, soft flax or linen. He goes on even about the connection between the beauty of a head covering and the beauty of the words that should come from the mouth of a wife. This is his wife, Katharina von Bora. Zwingli wrote, this passage refers to either those teaching or listening to the word of God. That's an interesting approach. Uh, So it's not merely somebody addressing the congregation that covers or doesn't cover. Uh, It's somebody participating perhaps silently in corporate prayer or somebody uh, sitting at the feet of somebody uh, preaching. Naturally, people are free from certain external practices, but in such a way that the public custom is upheld that which maintains public decency and is customary should not be defiantly disregarded. So he might be a number three, perhaps a number two. John Calvin writes, what was was at that time in common use by universal consent and custom, he speaks as as being natural. So one of the big interpretive questions here is, what does Paul mean by nature? When Paul says nature itself teaches you. He reckons as nature a custom that had come to be confirmed. So at least at the outset here, Calvin seems to think that uh, by nature what Paul really means is a custom that had become so ingrained that it's as though nature. Calvin goes on, though. He gives me mixed signals. I'm not quite sure where to place him. He says, The apostle requires women to show their modesty, not merely in a place which the whole church is assembled, but also in any more dignified assembly, either of matrons or of men, such as are sometimes convened in private houses. That's an interesting detail. So not for him exclusive to the gathered congregation, but general to the activity 
He now maintains from other considerations that it is unseemly for women to have their heads bare. Nature itself, says he, abhors it. To see a woman shaven is a spectacle that is disgusting and monstrous. Should anyone now object that her hair is enough as being a natural covering, Paul says that it is not, for it is such a covering as requires another thing to be made use of for covering it. So you might think of like three separate issues here. One is uh, whether it's naturally appropriate for a woman to grow out her hair, naturally inappropriate for a man to grow out his hair, and uh, whether the custom of uh, the artificial covering uh, is follows suit with those true prior truths. Um, Calvin does seem to affirm uh, the view that uh, to, to shave a, a lady's head would be dishonorable, um, and that's a matter of nature to him. Um, and he seems to think that the artificial covering actually is built to be uh, suitable for or congruent to the natural propriety of female hair length. Yet the beginning, beginning part of his remark seems to suggest uh, the view number one. So he, he sends mixed signals to me. Peter Martyr Vermigli. And by the way, uh, I found this, res this resource of great help, Reformation Commentary on Scripture, uh, this one's on 1 Corinthians, and it quotes from uh, Reformation figures. This would be incredible for sermon prep if you've got it on the whatever book you're, you're preaching on. Lots of gems. Italian-born Calvinist, theolo by, I, by the way, I mentioned that resource at the bottom of the sheet. Italian-born Calvinist theologian Vermigli writes, A woman ought, seeing her hair, is given her of God to follow this, his institution, and to imitate her maker and cover her head, which if she will not do, as much as is in her, she throws off the natural veil. So if you see where he says, to imitate her maker, that to me signals view number one, that the covering is meant to imitate uh, the maker in nature, uh, in what he did in nature. The Geneva Bible Notes in 1560 uh, to me, signals a really strong number three. Quote, it appeareth that this was a politic law, serving only for the circumstances of the time that Paul lived in. By this reason, because in these are days for a man to speak bareheaded in an assembly is a sign of subjection. So if you catch that, uh, whoever is writing this note in, in the Geneva Bible believes that in his day to preach with your covering, your male hat on signals authority. So it... it um, for the writer here, uh, it satisfies Paul's greater concern that one would find some sort of local expression of authority and submission, even if it's reverse of the particulars of what Paul uh, promoted. Lutheran theologian and Protestant reformer, Tileman Heshusius, who at least has a good beard going for him, writes, Paul instructs them as to what accords with decency and what nature itself teaches. By her veiled head, she ought to profess that she is under her husband's authority and that she owes her husband modesty and reverence. William Gouch, member of the Westminster uh, Assembly, by the way, he wrote a book called Of Domestical Duties, a great uh, kind of a complementarian book before there was a genre on that. A uh, really neat uh, Puritan book on the, the family life. He quotes Chrysostom that not nature only, but also her own will, have part in her acknowledgement of subjection. John Cotton, also a member of the Westminster Assembly, writes, all the members of the church are to join together, the men with their heads uncovered and women covered. The Church of England, in its constitutions and canons, ecclesiastical, 1604, writes, a reverence and attention to be used within the church in time of divine service. No man shall cover his head in the church or chapel in the time of divine service, except he have some infirmity in which case, let him wear a nightcap or a coif. Samuel Rutherford, Scottish Presbyterian and a commissioner to the Westminster Assembly, writes, The Jews of, uh, to this day, as of old, used covering as a sign of honor. If therefore the Jews, being made a visible church, shall receive the Lord's Supper and pray and prophesy with covered heads, men would judge it no dishonoring of their head or not of disrespect of the ordinances of God. So that's a pretty clear number three. He believes the ordinance... Uh, is reversible. I use the word ordinance uh, loosely, like singing 
uh, the Baptist considered an ordinance, a matter of church administration and order. The Westminster Confession of Faith reads, quote, there are some circumstances concerning the worship of God and the government of the church common to human actions and societies, which are to be ordered by the light of nature and Christian prudence, according to the general rules of the word, which are always to be observed. Of note here is the scripture proof they attach as a uh, support for this. Uh, in the footnote they have as their proof text, 1 Corinthians 11, verses 13 and 14, which reads, Judge in yourselves, is it comely that a woman pray unto God uncovered? Doth not even nature itself teach you that if a man hath long hair, it is a shame unto him? So they see that as a good support for the idea that the light of nature should inform away a church, uh, administers and orders itself. George Gillespie, Scottish theologian, writes, it is also a natural sign, and, a natu and nature itself it's, teaches it. Therefore, he urges it both by the inferiority and subjection of the woman. I should stop there and make note that in the Westminster Confession, there is talk of how Christians should relate to inferiors and superiors. And this uh, is language applied to parents and children, employers, employees, um, mag civil magistrates, husbands and wives. So this is the language of rank, not of value. Continuing, and by the long hair which nature gives to a woman, where he would have the artificial covering to be fashioned in the imitation of the natural. Here taking view number one. Benjamin Keach, at least associated with Keach's catechism, I'm not sure if he actually wrote that. He was a particular Baptist preacher and author in London. He writes, a woman ought to have power on her head that is a garment signifying that she is under the power of her husband. John Bunyan of The Pilgrim's Progress writes, For this cause ought the woman to have power that is a covering on her head because of the angels. Methinks, holy and beloved sisters, you should be content to wear the power, this power or badge. Nonconformist minister known for his six-volume biblical commentary, Matthew Henry, um, he writes, Custom is in great measure the rule of decency. It was the common usage of the churches for women to appear in public assemblies and join in public worship veiled, and it was manifestly decent that they should do so. Seemingly signaling view number three, where custom itself defines um, decency. English Calvinist Baptist pastor John Gill writes, everyone knows how dishonorable and scandalous it is for a woman to have her head shaved. And if this is the same, then it is dishonorable and scandalous for her to be without covering in public worship. Perhaps view number one here. Jonathan Edwards, famous American preacher and theologian, writes, It is against nature in a proper sense to bow down before an idol, because it is against nature to adore an idol, and bowing down by universal custom is used to denote adoration. But if bowing down by universal custom were used to denote contempt, it would not be against nature. So this is given as commentary on 1 Corinthians. And at first glance, it does look like he believes uh, perhaps hair length and or coverings are a matter of reversible custom. At least the substance of his immediate argument here is that um, the, the sense in which it's not natural uh, to bow down to an idol is not the intrinsic indecency of bowing. Uh, it's that to bow down before an idol is idolatrous, and idolatry is unnatural. And so he thinks that's the sense, perhaps, that nature might be used. I first heard this quote from John Piper, who summarizes Paul's use of nature in 1 Corinthians 11 in the following way, quote, this is Piper, Paul is saying that by nature a man feels shameful for wearing culturally defined symbols of womanhood. So he marshals support from Jonathan Edwards, to bolster this approach to interpreting the word, I think it's fusis, is nature. I am not convinced the quote above represents Edwards's more developed view on the matter. I later found where Edwards expanded his thoughts, writing over a hundred pages on the issue of hair length and head coverings. He continues uh, elsewhere here on long hair. I will show how it was and is against nature or the dictates of natural reason the soberest part of the world everywhere, 
Jews and infidels as well as Christians, wear not their hair at an extravagant length, speaking of men. Nature or right reason forbids the wearing of long hair to men because that is against the laws of natural decency and comeliness. An appeal to nature is a comprehensive topic, and you may understand it by the general dictate of natural reason and, and the particular law of nature concerning the distinction, distinction of sexes and also usage and custom, which is a second nature. As I read Edwards in this treatise, Paul's appeal to nature packs a cumulative punch. It is not a sheer appeal to reversible custom. Rather, it includes, one, that nature itself teaches men not to grow out their hair, at least inordinately long. He goes on and on about what that might mean. Two, the general principle of maintaining distinction between the sexes. And three, the principle of using culturally appropriate customs to best express this. So Edwards is not uh, sacrificing any one of those three points. He's just putting them all together and saying, well, that's what Paul means. <laughs> he just puts them all together. I'm convinced that Edwards, for example, would not agree that a culture could promote the shaving of female heads or the growing of male hair longer than that of a woman without opposing the built-in messaging of nature and of creational norms. John Wesley writes, if a woman is not covered, if she will throw off the badge of subjection, let her appeal appear with her hair cut like a man's. But if it be shameful for a woman to appear thus in public, especially, especially in a religious ceremony, let her, for the same reason, keep on her veil. Charles Hodge uh, seems to take more of a three- Number three view. He writes, a costume that is proper in one country would be indecorous in another. For a woman to discard the veil in Corinth, therefore, was to renounce her claim to modesty and to refuse to recognize her subordination to her husband. So maybe a three uh, usually just depends how they flesh that out. Charles Spurgeon. Uh, by the way, if you're ever in the Spurgeon Library, just look up at the paintings on the wall and you'll see head coverings uh, everywhere. Um, he writes, the apostle says that a woman is to have a covering upon her head because of the angels, since the angels are present in the assembly and they mark every act of indecorum, and therefore everything is to be conducted with decency and order in the presence of angelic spirits. I'll skip uh, H.A. Ironsign, for the sake of time. A.W. Pink, pro covering. John Murray helped found Westminster Theological Seminary, also pro covering. Uh, Welsh Protestant minister, Martin Lloyd-Jones writes, a woman should have her head covered to show that she is under the authority of the man. She should also be covered because of the presence of the angels. Charles Ryrie, uh, famous for his uh, position at Dallas Theological Seminary, dispensationalism, uh, defense of Arminianism, uh, he argues that the coverings are, quote, based on theology of headship, the order of creation, the presence of angels in the meeting, none of these reasons was based on contemporary social custom. In 1968, the National Organization of Women for Women put out a statement. You can read this on their website still today. It says, whereas the, one, the wearing of a head covering by women in, at, at religious services is a custom in many churches, and whereas it is a symbol of subjection within these churches, now, the acronym, recommends that all chapters undertake an effort to have all women participate in a national unveiling. So you can read at this time newspaper articles of this uncovering effort at helping those uh, with the more um, modern view of gender uh, celebrate that by throwing off the veil. Um, Bruce Watke, uh, also he was a he was a president of the Evangelical Theological Society. He writes, a woman who prays or prophesies in an assembly of believers should cover her head as a symbol of her submission to the absolute will of God who has ordered his universe according to his own good pleasure. And perhaps most surprisingly for some of you, there's R.C. Sproul. He writes, quote, a woman should have her head covered to show that she is under the authority of the man. She should also be covered because of the presence of the angels. He wrote a book on hermeneutics, uh, 
And in dealing with the question of 1 Corinthians 11, he addresses the question of whether Paul's teaching satisfies the, the criteria of a um, malleable custom or a transcultural principle. And he argues that there is more than enough criteria uh, for this being a durable principle that lasts. He writes, the wearing of fabric head coverings in worship was, a, was universally the practice of Christian women until the 20th century. What happened? Did we suddenly find some biblical truth to which the saints for thousands of years were blind, or were our biblical views of women gradually eroded by the modern feminist movement? Now, for a quick overview of modern views. Uh, Sam Waldron is, the, I think, the president of Covenant Baptist Theological Seminary. Uh, he rubs shoulders with the Reformed Baptist community. I'm not sure if you all know the Renahan brothers and that crowd, pretty cool crowd. Um, he takes the view that it is a binding and, uni- and a durable uh, symbol that we ought to uh, persist in using. But he argues that the covering is uh, having your long hair uh, done up or styled in an orderly or tidy fashion. Uh, this view, I have never found any support for this among uh, Reformed Baptist uh, 17th century guys or the Puritans um, or the early church fathers. But so a bit idiosyncratic view. Joel Beakey, president of Puritan Reformed Theological Seminary today. Uh, his church practices coverings, and he promotes it. Um, he, in the, uh, there's a study Bible he edited where he, there's a note that, uh, let's see here. Head covering was the universal custom practice of the churches. They rightly called it an ordinance and say that, quote, by man having his head uncovered and woman having her head covered, all glory points to God in public worship. Tim Bailey was uh, the former executive director of the Council for Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. Uh, does anybody know what CBMW is? Have you guys heard of that? Uh, we used to have Denny Burke. Maybe that's he's still there. We used to have Strahan, Bruce Ware, um, Grudem, Piper. Uh, Tim Bailey used to be uh, on the council uh, as a director, an executive director. Um, and he, his church practices coverings. Alexander Strock, known for his book on biblical eldership, uh, pastored a church in Colorado. It's a Plymouth Brethren church. So you're going to find more of this today in uh, more conservative, traditional Plymouth Brethren churches, let alone Anabaptist churches like uh, German Baptist or, um, of course, Amish or Mennonites, especially uh, rural conservative Mennonites. Strock uh, has a position paper that he wrote for his church promoting this. Um, Douglas Wilson takes a kind of an odd view. I say odd because um, while his view that he expresses here is very popular among laymen, it is virtually absent uh, among sort of like mainstream interpreters and common, uh, commentators. And uh, those, those are just sort of a part of the public discussion. But it's a very popular view that, the, that the, idea, the idea is that Paul only has one covering in view, that of the natural covering the hair. Uh, most, even most... Uh, uh, Complementarian uh, interpreters that uh, don't argue for present-day practice of coverings um, typically don't argue that hair is the only covering in view. Wayne Grudem writes, Today we, ought, we obey the head covering commands for women in 1 Corinthians 11 by encouraging married women to wear whatever symbolizes being married in their own cultures. So I assume that could be like a wedding ring. Uh, that typically is the go-to in uh, essays like that. Daniel B. Wallace, does anybody recognize him from uh, Greek? He wrote a Greek syntax book called Beyond the Basics, uh, popular at Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, his textbook on Greek syntax was sort of the, the big one before uh, Kostenberger here uh, in Merkel, uh, going deeper. He wrote a long essay on 1 Corinthians 11 and head coverings, where he concludes that the symbol today, at least having a distinct symbol for headship and submission, is something uh, transculturally and durably binding upon believers. He writes, in attempting to fulfill the spirit of the apostle's instructions, not just his words, some suitable substitute symbol needs to be found. I think the wearing of a modest dress is an appropriate symbol. He explicitly rejects uh, the use of um, a uh, wedding ring. He doesn't think that satisfies the criteria that Paul gives. 
Um, but it's sort of a really interesting, powerful essay. And at the very end, he's like, well, maybe a wedding dress will do. Um, uh, some would argue that this doesn't satisfy the criteria of being um, perhaps uh, toggleable, because it seems like something that could be taken off or on. Symmetric is something that um, is the kind of thing that you know, uh, when this event happens, one has it and one doesn't. And then something that's uh, naturally appropriate to the meaning of the symbol, namely headship. And a uh, head covering just happens to be on the head. So uh, dresses, uh, some would say, don't satisfy this, the, the potency of the original symbol. But Wallace at least says we ought to find a replacement symbol today. Um, but uh, the question is, well, what, what would the modern evangelical church choose? A very popular egalitarian, Craig Keener, writes, although many churches would use arguments from the order of creation to demand the subordination of women in all cultures, very few accept Paul's arguments in 1 Corinthians 11 as valid for covering women's head, heads in all churches. We take the argument as transculturally applicable in one case, 1 Timothy 2, but not in the other, 1 Corinthians 11. This seems very strange indeed. The, 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 the heart of this is that Paul in 1 Timothy 2, with, respects, with respect to authority and submission and teaching and silence, um, appeals to creation. And the idea is that if Paul is appealing to uh, something so creational uh, or natural and not to some artifact of culture, then we ought to take this as something um, that we ought to uh, tremble before we you know, sort of give it up. And Keener, an egalitarian, will take the sort of a cultural reductive view of both texts. Um, and he argues that complementarians are ultimately inconsistent uh, by uh, Paul's appeal to nature and, and creation of 1 Timothy 2, but um, are, are ultimately arguing this that this is a malleable cultural matter in 1 Corinthians 11. Benjamin Merkel is sort of the go-to guy today in the TGC. He has, he has an academic article out um, uh, responding to this sort of argument. Uh, he writes, Paul's argument from creation, which demonstrates men and women are distinct, cannot be culturally relegated. The application of this principle, i.e. head coverings, then uh, can and does change with culture. Uh, if, I get, if I get the essence of his TGC article, which summarizes his uh, academic article, is that uh, it's that Paul's argument uh, for head coverings, you can't draw a straight line between that and the order of creation. Uh, he argues that you roundabout get from order of creation to head coverings, and if it were a straighter line, so to speak, uh, we could make uh, the same kind of arguments we do with 1 Corinthians 2. Then there's Stephen Wedgworth, popular Desiring God writer, uh, thinker, and he, uh, he looks at 1 Corinthians 11 as uh, teaching that we as evangelicals ought to sp pay special attention to decorum, that as evangelicals perhaps we have uh, lost sight of the idea of thinking carefully about decorum in the gathered assembly, that we ought to have some sort of gendered distinction uh, in the way that we think about um, presenting ourselves in the gathering, and that we ought to utilize symbols as they're available. So I, there are cultural echoes uh, of head coverings today. Uh, many of you take off your hats when you pray or sing the national anthem. And there is a modern movement among evangelicals and uh, Protestants to recover head covering, head coverings. Um, one of them is called, uh, markets itself as the head covering movement. Um, and there's sort of like Etsy shops popping up uh, promoting uh, what might be stylistic and uh, beautiful head coverings for women. Um, it's Cassie's Corner. Uh, here's some examples of head coverings. Uh, they, they, they look different throughout the ages. Um, they took different shapes, different forms. Arguably, in the 1900s, they became very ostentatious, and uh, they became more stylistic. And it, uh, from the reading I did anyway, it seemed as though uh, Christians lost a sense of the theological significance of them. And so when, the, uh, when feminism uh, hit hard, and affluence, and uh, a sense of mainstreaming, and globalization, affluence, if I already said that, uh, uh, when the when the tide turned on the styles of coverings, uh, that was, it was just easily dropped. We, we lost the sort of the, the meaning of it. Um, so yeah, you could see 
how it started to really change. Um, one of the most interesting questions for me, which I did not get the chance to chase out as much as I wanted to, is why uh, did this drop in the 1900s? Um, what was like what what are the variables at play? Uh, how quickly did this happen? Um, what what kind of uh, tilling of the soil happened before the actual practice dropped? Um, so what, of, of my reading, uh, it, it said that the the interpretation, um, the the interpretive changes uh, were more mainstream in the 1800s, and it was in the early and mid 1900s that the practice was dropped. Um, a, according to David Phillips, the the practice was almost uh, unanimous. It was almost uh, just completely consistent with a few exceptions up until the late 1800s, I think. And it was almost dominant, it was near dominant until the mid 20th century. Figured I'd uh, end with a joke. Uh, Do you have any questions? How much of a uh, this is more of a question. Based on your research and understanding of the current church, where it's headed, um, how much of a hill Zion or like matter significance is this moving forward? Like, if, I, I, one I, argument from the covering head covering movement is that um, uh, it might be that today, in the absence of sane thinking about gender the recovery of a symbol is exactly what we need because it confronts us uh, with the reality of the order of creation. So it might be uh, much much like um, the Salvation Army Church across the street uh, does not practice baptism. And they argue that the meaning of the symbol matters more than the symbol itself. Whereas we might respond as Protestants that God designed the symbol to keep our attention on the meaning of the symbol. Mm 